I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Uh, my life, I started off going to Sunday school. I was looking at all these children here. I didn't want to go. Mom, I don't want to go. You're going. And she put a little bow tie on me, and I had to go because there was consequences if I didn't go. That means I'd be in trouble. I'd get punished if I didn't go. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. You're going. My mom had a care for us. There was five of us in the family, and she wanted the very best for us. We fought like cats and dogs at home, and we're disobedient to mom and dad. Uh, that wasn't a good thing because we'd reap what we'd sown. In other words, we'd get punished for what we did and said. Uh, there was no holding back on that, but we were rebellious. And that's why my mom knew and she believed in God. She wasn't saved, but she had a fear of God. She used to watch Billy Graham and some other people on TV, but she was not saved. And so we had to go to Sunday school. And we were taught, thou shalt not lie. Wow, that one hurt. Thou shalt not steal. There's another one. I was lying, I was stealing. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That one I said, no, I don't want to do that one. I don't want to take God's son's name in a bad way like my friends would do. And... There were so many, thou shalt not covet, the Ten Commandments. And I was guilty, but I didn't really feel my need. And where I was going to Sunday school, they were teaching us, as our brother said, the middle verse, I think it was John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I thought, in my own thinking as a young boy, we're all going to heaven. That's what I honestly thought in my heart. And so I would say my prayers at night, because mom would say, say your prayers. And now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Uh, and so on. And at school, our Father, which art in heaven. So I thought I was a good guy, even though I was doing everything wrong. You still think that the heart's so deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And God in His grace allowed me to keep hearing the Word of God and to memorize some scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this was going on for a little while. And then our Sunday school got torn down. Yeah, it got torn down. There was a big Catholic church, and they said, we want that property. So they took the property, and I go, yes, no more Sunday school. But that wasn't the end of the story. My mom brought in another religion, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we had to study with them for a while. And then I was going to the Catholic church with my friends. But when I was a little boy, if there's anyone here, four or five here tonight, I got ran over by an ice cream truck. It was called the Yummy Man. And what I was trying to do was steal. And so I slipped on some ice. In them days, you used to put your hand in, all the ice would come out. And I didn't have no money. I said, me and Jim, we didn't have any money, a nickel. That's all it cost. But I slipped under the tire, and he got into his vehicle, and he rolled over my leg and I got a broken leg. I went down to Sick Children's Hospital and I tell this story for maybe some sisters here. Uh, it still touches my heart. I could start weeping right away here, but uh, a broken leg at Sick Children's Hospital and feeling lonely. Where's mom? What's going on here? And two girls came to see me. Well, maybe 15, 16. And they said, David, do you know who we are? I said, no. We're your Sunday school teachers. And they pulled up from their back a toy airplane. I was the happiest guy. They said, it's for you. And I took my mind off my leg. And I never forgot that. I said, Lord, I hope they're in heaven. A good deed like that for a little child. 
And not too long after that, me and my brother Jim were fighting, and I got another broken leg. I got hit by a car. My brother Jim was beating me up, and I was so scared of him, I ran right in front of a car, and 63 days down at St. Joseph's Hospital. A body cast on me. I go, oh no, what's going on here? Oh, I was only 14. But God was speaking to me. Even as a young child, I wasn't listening to God's word. I wanted to do my own thing, my sports. We played a lot of cards at home. Uh, my dad was a gambler. And so we learned all the card games and, and sports. And I was a disc jockey, collecting records, hundreds and hundreds of records. And I thought life was pretty good. I was having a good time. And then going to grade nine, remember going to grade nine, I didn't do too good at school, but that's another story. Uh, I'm not too happy about that, but God is no respecter of persons. He loves each one of us. And I remember going there and everybody was trying to show off. It was mostly a girl's school. And going to this here school, uh, I wanted to show people how tough I was. That's pride. That's all pride. That's, that's a no-no. And I just wanted to show them because I wasn't good at academics and things like that. And I remember these here five boys walking down with their trench coats on. And I said, now's my chance to show them how tough I am in this school. And he called me a name. And I was sort of happy he said that. And I said the same to him. And they all turned around. And my friend walked away from me. And I just went to hit him. And he pulled out a knife. It's a, it was a switchboard, a switch, a switchblade knife. And he put it right to my throat. And I just closed my eyes and standing on my toes and I said, I'm going to die. That's what I said in my heart. I says, I just did that. And on my toes, he goes, you'll never say that again, will you? I go, no, sir. He gave me a chance. That was God's grace. And my friend said, you were shaking like a leaf because I thought I was going to die. 16 years old, trying to be a show off. And God had to Humble me, break me down, to show me you're not invincible, you're not here forever. One day you're going to die, now you've been spared, and things were coming back to me, but it still didn't change me. I had no power within myself, I still wanted to be a showboat, I still wanted to show how tough I was, and at 17 I got into another fight up in St. Clair and Dufferin. It was Little Italy. We were at the Tivoli restaurant. And I didn't want to fight this person. But he challenged me, and I was scared. I was holding onto the table. The table broke. That's how scared I was. But then he got me outside, and we started fighting. And next thing you know, the police are putting the handcuffs on me and taking me to jail. And I said, this only happens in the movies. And they put me behind the bars and I said, I'm in jail. And the police said, you got to phone home. I said, oh no, I can't phone mom and dad. I'd be in major trouble. But I had to phone home because I wanted to get bailed out. So I was hoping my mom so badly would answer that phone. And she did. But my dad came down and picked me up. And I didn't like that. He says, next time you're here, you stay here. I go, yes, dad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. He started it. He did start it, but that's just a, a cop-out. I didn't back down. But the thing is, I was reaping what I'd sown again. I was disobedient, thinking that I was somebody again. And this went on and on and on. And God was still speaking. In them days, we were taking drugs and alcohol. We, I, every, all the... All the sayings were party hardy, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Everybody was saying that at work, thinking that we're invincible and nothing's going to happen to us. But things were happening. People were taking their lives. A friend of mine, Tim, jumping off a bridge. I thought, not Tim. 
He was the happiest guy there was, I thought, taking his life. And then my friend, my best friend, Frank LaCaprera, 21 years old, down at Maple Leaf Gardens, to rock and roll concerts. And I didn't want to go down that day. And somebody came back, one of his friends, my friends, and he says, Frank died. Frank died. And I thought it was, Frank can't die. We used to talk how invincible we were. But no, Frank died. And that was a shock. I said, take me to the hospital then, because I can't believe that. It was too hard on my, on my mind, losing my best friend. I remember going to the funeral, and his sister's name was Anna. And I says, Anna, don't cry. Don't worry. He's in heaven. We were 21 years old. He's in heaven, so don't worry about it. How do you know? And that scared me. I go, well, we all go to heaven. That's what I thought. In my own blindness, my own stubbornness, I thought, we all go there. Just do the best we can down here. How do you know when she was crying? I said, oh, wow, why is she asking me that for? I said, Anna, because we just go there. Not once did I ever think that there was a hell until I found it in the Bible. Whosoever was not found, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I never even thought that. We used to tell each other to go there every day. It was just a common word. And I thought about my best friend, I go, whoa, how do I get along without him? When you have a best friend, you cherish that. Even though you fight like cats and dogs, you cherish that. And life was going on and on, and then other things started to happen in my life. I got a broken family, and my friends didn't want me, the stuff I was doing, and... Work didn't want me after a while. He says, Dave, we're going to have to let you go. You're not the same person that you used to be. I was getting into a lot of wrong stuff, a lot of messes. And I remember when that there drug scene was going on, I said, we got to get more, more, more of this. Thinking that's the way of happiness in life. Trust me, it's not. It's hurtful. It's sadness. It's emptiness. And I said, oh, need help here. Need help. God started moving in my life. Majorly. Humbling me. Breaking me down. Emptying me. Show me. I'm only, I'm only weak. Another bad relationship. Oh. Whoa, what do I do? I got it. I know what I'm going to do. I'll take my life. I'm just telling you the way it is. That's what I honestly thought. I was a broken mess. Looking for help. An SOS. 911. Help me. I was phoning the distress centers. That's how broken I was. And I could see other people. I didn't see anybody as bad as me or as empty or broken as me because you can only see yourself. And I says, oh, how do you come through this? And this was going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. I go, I'll try this way to get out of it. That's it. I'll try this way. But in the meantime, I was calling on God. God, could you help me? Could you step into my life? Could you... Help me. Mind you, I was crying my eyes out. And family couldn't help me. I went to the doctors. They gave me some tranquilizers. I, they went down the toilet because I used to take drugs all the time. And I didn't want no more of that. Family, friends, doctors. I go, who do I go to? No one can help in my situation. Nobody. And I remember just kept calling to God. God, I don't want to take my life. I don't know how to do that. But I can't live like this. So do I go for the pills? Is there any way you'll help? Is there any way that you would help me? And I was feel like crying now. <laughs> but I remember going to see my mom. Moms will always stick by you. 100%. Moms are always there. Even though you rebel and 
they wait up for you, they do this and that for you. And I'm talking to my mom. She must have had an inkling what was going on in my life. And she said, God, could you help David? Then she started to cry. And I said, oh, no. Mom, it's okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. I wasn't all right, but I don't want my mom to be hurt. I says, Mom, it's okay. Don't you even think about it. Nothing's going to happen. Meanwhile, I was planning in my mind, this is going to happen. And I got to do this soon because I couldn't function. If you ever heard the word zombie, you're dead. You're broken and messed up. And never make fun of anybody who you see just helpless in themselves. Because God loves that person. No respect of persons. Whosoever. And I remember thinking to myself, as I was driving the car, so many times I just said, just turn and go over that there embankment. Do it. And I just didn't do it. And I'd be driving around 2 o'clock in the morning. Just empty. My diet was two packs of cigarettes, bottle of Coca-Cola, and a bag of chips. I couldn't eat. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't sleep. I remember thinking to myself one Sunday, driving the car, I said, there's a church. A church. I've never been in the church. Now I'm 33 years old, not 12 anymore. Tried all this different stuff, and look where it got me. Broken. Suicidal. I remember parking my car, leaving the Coke and chips and cigarettes there, and running across the street to the Highfield Road Gospel Hall. And I walked in, it was about three in the afternoon, and there was two sisters there, Mrs. Esther Gordon and Jill Davies, and they said, come back tonight, we got a meeting. I said, it's okay, I'll be back, you can count on it. My heart, I said, I'm not coming back here, I needed help, and he didn't help me. So I went up the street to find another church, and I opened the door, pardon me, the doors weren't open. I says, oh, no, maybe I'll go down to that little place then. So at 7 o'clock, I was down there, went upstairs, nobody was there. And I said, where's everybody? At 7 o'clock, then I went downstairs, and I opened up the doors, and I was shocked. People with hats and dresses and suits. I wasn't used to that. I was in total darkness. And I said, do I, what do I do here? I had the door one I said, get going. Don't come in here. It's like a, a cult or something. It's something scary about this place. But I remember, I just closed my eyes and I went and sat down at the back seat. And just like our brother was saying, a young brother named Roger McIntyre comes out. He starts speaking about Jesus. I go, Jesus? And then his father came out, Les McIntyre, and he started speaking about the same message about Jesus. And I knew that when I was a little boy. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. But don't they know that Jesus is lower than God? I'm thinking all this in my mind. I didn't know that the Lord Jesus was God manifest in flesh. Not at this time. And so I started coming out. And the brethren said to me, do you want to speak to somebody? I needed a friend. I needed someone to help me. And I said, yes. And the person who asked that, his name was Brian Crilly. He says, I know you. You're the receiver at Gestetner, and you unload my tractor trailer. I go, who is this guy? Sir, I don't know anybody with a suit, I said. I don't know anybody. I don't know you. He goes, I know you, though. And I needed help. And I was so thankful. He pointed me to some people and got to talk to people. And they were talking about sin. And that went right over me because even though I was going through all that, I thought I was a good guy. Did you lie? Yeah. Steal? Yeah. Disobedient mom and dad? Yeah. In jail? Yeah. Drugs? Alcohol? Yeah. 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 But I still thought I was a good guy because I would help people. Or I'd say my prayers at night. I went to Sunday school. But that didn't cut it. God is holy. 
And I thought to myself, oh, what's, what's going on here? So I continued to come because I needed help and I needed a friend. And then to make a long story short here, there was one brother at the back and I'd been coming for about five weeks. So I got to know the gospel uh, a little bit. How that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But all these things I didn't really grasp. Even though the truth about the Lord Jesus was being spoken about so clearly, so faithfully. And then one day I was walking down to the back after the gospel meeting. And I still don't know to this day who it was. I remember thinking to myself, well, I got a family here. I got people who care for me because they all come around shaking hands with me. And I'm secretly thinking before I says, if they knew who I was, they wouldn't be shaking hands with me. But they seem to have a genuine care. And that's what I needed, someone to care for me. But I walked down to the back and the brother said to me, David, I go, yes, sir. He goes, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I go, of course. Yes, I do. I had the big smile. He goes, what do you believe about him? I says, well, that he died for sinners. He goes, that's not good enough. Until you believe it was for you, you're going to, you're going to hell. And that was a wake-up call. That was what the Spirit of God used for me to get my attention to get me focused where I would spend eternity you see I always thought I was going to be in heaven John 3 16 I didn't know about whosoever I just thought I was gonna be there and he got my attention the Spirit of God through this man show me that my sins were gonna take me down to a lost eternity in hell in the lake of fire. That, that was a real wake-up call. And he says on top of it all, pardon me, he didn't say that. He might have said it in his message, but I knew the Lord was going to come. I said, whoa, no. I'm going to hell and the Lord's coming. And you know what that stopped me from doing? It stopped me from wanting to take my own life now. There's no more of that suicide for me. Because I knew where I was going. If I died in my sins, like the Lord Jesus said, where I am, you can't go. You'll be in that awful, awful place called hell. Then the lake of fire. And I started thinking, well, what do I do to be saved? How do, how do I get this? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. I says, I think I do that, sir. He goes, are you saved? And he scared me even more by saying, I go, no, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. Then Brother Roger, he took me up to Lansing Gospel Hall. And he, a brother by the name of Mr. Harold Paisley was there. And after the meeting, he said, do you want to be saved? I said, yes, I do, sir. When? Right now. I'd love to be saved because I was... I wanted to be saved. I used to go home and cry my eyes out. God, please save me. Save me. Once you know the truth, you want it more than anything else. There was nothing else I wanted more than to be saved. So he said, let's go down on our knees. And I stopped. I'd be truthful. I just watched him go down. I go, down on our knees. Mm. And I looked around the hall. People were looking. I said, I don't know about that. I don't know. When I saw him down there waiting for me, and I says, oh, then the thought came, do you want to be saved or not? I go, I want to be saved. And I just closed my eyes and went down on my knees. And he started praying. He started praying for me. Someone was praying. I go, this, is, this must be where I get saved. I'm thinking this in my heart. Because this older man is praying for me. And... Then he finishes prayer, and I go, oh, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. And I wanted to be saved. And he says, you go home and read your Bible and ask the Lord to save you. Start praying. Ask the Lord to save you. I says, I'm already I'm doing that now. And I was felt so helpless. So then I stopped drinking, smoking, swearing, stealing, fighting, lying. I thought that was helping. 
that would help me to get saved. I really did. And the preacher would always say, Dave, the work is finished on the cross. Can't you be satisfied with that? God is satisfied. I go, yes, but I'm still trying. It's like our brother said, I was trying to believe. I was trying to believe. I was trying to receive and accept. I was hearing all those words, but there was still a ton of pride in my heart. I can look back now. I was loaded with pride. Me, myself, and I. Like our brother was saying, I'm better than I could never do. You see, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So God started the process. He started breaking me down. He started showing me, it's your sin, Dave. Your sin. Your sin. You're going to be in hell. Hell. And I was terrified. God, please don't send me there. And please, don't let your son come back till you save me. Please, am I asking too much? I was having a pity party because I was looking at brethren that were saved and contentment on their, fa- on their faces. And I'm going, how did they get it though? How did they get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I said, well, I, I, I think I do though. I'm saying this to myself. God, I believe in your son. I believe in him, that he died for sinners, but I never took it personally. I was never born again. I never took that personally. But God in his grace, it's all grace, he started breaking me and taking me lower, lower. You know what the Bible says? For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That was me, ungodly. Wicked to the core, bad to the bone. And God was starting to show me, show me. And I was looking to the Lord Jesus. And I said, I don't know how to get saved. I've stopped doing all this stuff. Then it came to me, I understand now. I got it. I'm too bad. That's what I thought in my heart. I'm too bad. Bad. God's not going to save me. No, he'll save other people. I start feeling sorry for myself. But he's not going to save me because I'm too bad. I'm too rotten. And I remember just taking a deep breath. I go, wow, it's all over for me. It was almost, that was God's love, but it was almost a mercy that I didn't have to try anymore. Try, 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 stop doing this. I didn't know what else... I didn't know what else to stop. I remember just thinking, I'm going to hell. I deserve it. I'm going to hell. And I can't do anything about it. I says, oh, if I could have only trusted the Lord Jesus, but I didn't know how to do it. So I went to turn up the light. This was January 16th, 1983. And I said, wait, wait, wait. I might as well just finish that last chapter, Matthew 27. My brother spoke a little bit about that. And so I started reading, and I got up to where they put a crown of thorns on the Lord Jesus' head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head. And then they spit on him. They spit on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where I laid back, because that was my life. It was a wicked life. And I laid back, wait, 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 did I get this right? They spit on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did they do that? Look what he did for others. Died on the cross for their sins. He loved the unlovable. He cared. He's the good shepherd that would give his life for the sheep. If I could only have made it personal that it was for me. If I could only understood the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I could have only taken that in. That when he took that spit, when he took that cross, he would do it for a sinner like me. And I said, oh, if it was only for me. And just like that, I understood for the first time in my life, it was for me. He died for me, the just one, for me, the unjust. And I started bawling my eyes out. 
I was filled with joy. I just plopped on my knees. No one had to tell me this time to plop on my knees. I plopped down and I thanked them and I thanked them. And then I thanked them again. And then I thanked them again. I kept thanking them because I could hardly take it in that God would love me to give his son for me. And now I'm not going down to hell. And I thought, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm going to be in heaven because the Lord Jesus died for a sinner like me, deserving the wrath of God. But God's love is so, so great. And I'll make this here very, very quick. Next day I had, a, uh, I had an appointment to go see somebody because I, was, I wanted to be saved. I was going everywhere. I want, please save me. Help me. And this here man said, David, a loving God's not going to send anyone down to hell. This is just on the same day that the Lord had saved me. I was born again. And I says, well, it says it. Uh, he goes, no, 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 no. I said, no, because I told him I was born again now. I didn't understand everything. And he goes, David, remember that. I says, well, I don't swear anymore. And every word came out of that man with a long gown on and just another verse came to me from from the book of matthew where i was reading by their fruit ye shall know them beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing which are inwardly ravening wolves but by their fruits you're going to know them and so i thought whoa i won't be coming back here anymore god in his grace reached down and saved me and then my brother jim got saved and my mom got saved still got a lot of family members not saved. January 16th, 1983. That's 40 years. And God's so faithful and gracious. And He wants to save you if you're not saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want it more than anything else. It's got to be number one priority. That you want Him. You want to look to the cross and thank Him. Thank Him and thank Him that He died for your sins on the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God says thou shalt be saved. Would you take time to pray?